My name is Jerry Ma. I serve as the Director of Emerging Technology and the Chief AI Officer at the USPTO. Uh, so I'm uh, very excited about you know, all the recent happenings in the AI world. But I want to get a poll from the audience, quick, just straw poll. Um, who here has used an AI application in the past year? Okay, so I see most hands up, and the hands I don't see, I'm going to attribute to uh, maybe playing Candy Crush or something. Because I feel like the answer, um, you know, with very little hesitation, is going to be arbitrarily close to 100%. And, you know, there, there's good reason. The, the recent sort of revolution in generative AI and other frontier AI technologies has really taken the world by storm. Um, and, you know, we at the USPTO bear witness to all the great things going on in the AI community. Uh, when we look at the um, AI landscape, what we see is American leadership. We see American scientists building these frontier AI models. We see American entrepreneurs taking them to the market. We see American hardware companies building the world's leading edge supercomputers and supercomputing hardware. Um, and you know, just all around, uh, we see evidence of our leadership in this emerging and, and very critical space. We at the USPTO are pleased to play a role in advancing a whole of government agenda and maintaining and securing this leadership and in ensuring a positive vision of AI across society and the economy. So we're pleased to uh, participate certainly in formulating IP policy pertaining to AI, uh, but we're also eager to uh, think about the impacts of AI more broadly across the innovation landscape, all forms of IP, whether it's patents, trademarks, trade secrets, or copyrights, uh, we'll, we'll have um, issues pertaining to AI. And within the USPTO, a lot of our operational work actually stands to benefit quite a bit from recent advances in AI and other emerging technology. Um, so I am so pleased to be joined today by a panel of AI leaders from across the country uh, who've, who've built AI uh, companies, invested in AI companies, and have ultimately um, you know, paved the way in advancing AI in all its forms across a whole host of different market sectors and use cases. So without further ado, I'm going to ask each of our panelists here to introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll jump right into the questions of this panel. Uh, starting with you, Erica. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so my name is Erica Barr. I'm the founder and CEO of DAX. Uh, I might spent the past 10 years in data pipeline management and building machine learning models for Fortune 500 companies. Most recently, I helped AWS with their AI go-to-market strategy. And what our company is, is it's DAX. It's a next generation um, AI accuracy for enterprise and highly regulated industries. So just asking who has ever queried something or asked a question to chat GPT and then it gave you the wrong answer or it hallucinated. Anybody ever have issues? Yes, yeah, so our company helps to fix that for enterprise and, and highly regulated industries. Excellent, next is Anna. Yes, hi everybody. Thank you so much for having us here today. Um, so my name is Anna Yuan. I'm the co-founder of Scale Growth AI. And we are on a mission to really democratize access to technology and AI. So we build a platform where anybody who are non-technical will be able to quickly launch AI-powered applications. And on top of that, we also give you a multi-agent system where you can help using that to run your business day-to-day -day operations. And um, our street type of agent works for your customers, co-pilot for your team, and also gave that AI analyst to help your decision maker to make AI-driven, data-driven decisions. So that's Scale Growth AI. And prior to that, I used to run a um, marketing agency. I helped companies like Apple, Cisco, NVIDIA at the time to really source their um, and products around or their equipments from around the world. Um, and then I was a native, actually, um, a hardware engineer. If you, any of you remember Motorola Razor phone, I was actually one of the designer uh, for that phone and I had a couple of patterns from designing that phone. So that's the fun story from the past life. Excellent. And finally, rounding out our panel will be Marianne. Hi, so I'm Marianne. I've been leading engineering teams in Silicon Valley for the last 15 years. I've led engineering teams through six different exits. I helped take New Relic IPO, 
Most recently, I was director of engineering at MindBody, where we grew the team from seven to over 50 in SF, Pune, and New York. Um, but we were able to maintain a ratio of 55% women engineers. So I've dedicated the majority of my career to promote diversity in tech. Most recently, I started my own company, Upward Recruiting, to really help companies hire more women engineers. And suddenly, I found myself being an entrepreneur. So I started going to a lot of entrepreneurship events, and then I would find myself again being the only woman in the room. So then I started asking myself, well, where are the women founders? I cannot find them. So then I decided to start my own community of tech female founders. Now we are one of the largest and most active communities in the Bay Area. We have over 350 startups, all women founded. Erica and Anna are here. Um, they're part of Women Founders Bay. Um, and then most recently, I joined as a general partner at Progressive Ventures. Now I invest in AI B2B companies um, and I help them grow through technical advice and through connecting them with the right talent and technology. Awesome, so now you've met our awesome um, panelists, Erica, Anna, and Marianne, and we're gonna jump right in um, with a question that I think is on the top of many people's minds. You know, when I go to parties, social events these days, uh, I get two questions often uh, in rapid succession. The first question is, um, let's get this thing's on. Okay, perfect. Uh, the first question I get is um, sort of how did you get into AI? And the second question in close succession is how do I get into the AI industry? And um, this is a tricky one, an interesting question, because there's just so many different paths. You know, 10 years ago, there was no such thing as generative AI. Certainly, there were generative models that AI scientists talk about, but there was no burgeoning subfield of generative AI. So if you hear someone say they have a decade of experience with generative AI, or you see a job posting that says, you know, we were asking for a decade of uh, generative AI job or career experience, uh, you know that the, you know, they're, they, they probably don't know what they're talking about. So this is all to say a lot, so many things are new in AI that um, there just aren't really any traditional entry paths. Everyone I've talked to um, who's a big shot in the AI world has their own story, has their own um, genesis of what got their AI bug ticking. So I'd like to ask each of our panelists in turn exactly that question. How did you get into the AI world? What was your background and what allowed you to launch uh, sort of your career into a AI-shaped or AI-inflected trajectory? Starting with you, Eric. Awesome, that's a great question. So I began in the space because of data. Like my original um, exposure to the corporate world was actually moving all the data from a startup to a cloud solution. And then, of course, in my graduate school, I both at Harvard and at Darden, they were very heavy onto like machine learning. Um, it was uh, MSBA program. And so they were bringing in a lot of aspects of AI before it was really a, a big thing. So we did machine learning models instead of case studies, we built machine learning models. And um, then when I went to corporate, it was, it was so prevalent, right? Because um, right as I had started building out machine learning models for Fortune 500 companies, they then moved me on to integrating AI solutions for these Fortune 500 companies. And there were so many issues with it. Like it hallucinated. They were like, don't ever make this client facing. Like there's all these problems with integrating AI at, at the enterprise level. And so, um, I had done all these POCs with these companies trying to make it more accurate, trying to make it more efficient for them. And that's when I was like, I could start my own company. Like I could do this myself outside of corporate. And um, that's when I started the US Department of Defense Incubator Program and uh, learned that the government had a huge need for accurate and secure AI solutions. And um, at the time, also, in, I moved to the Bay Area and started going to these tech board game nights uh, that were kind of crazy. Like, it was a, a very tech heavy. They would build out these AI games and we would like play them. And one of the guys there was working at OpenAI at the time. And I was like, hey, why isn't AI more accurate? Like, why does it hallucinate? All, it has all these problems. Like, it's. it's it's causing a lot of problems for enterprise adoption. 
And he's like, no, actually there's ways we can make this more accurate. And he started talking to me and we started having these coffee chats. And then I was like, well, if you're not happy at your job at OpenAI, then you should quit your job and we should do this company. And that was a Friday. And then the next Monday, he told me he put in his two weeks notice and uh, we started the company. And it did a very intensive incubator program, went to like a hacker house for a weekend, built all weekend and did pitches, got the pitches kind of like ripped apart every three hours. And then that's when DAX was like truly born. And we just saw such a prevalent need in this, both through my corporate experience and then also now after building the product, just hearing about all the different companies that need a more accurate AI solution. Awesome, thank you, Erica. And just um, in case anyone sort of doubts the credulity of that story, I can confirm that that is the prototypical <laughs> Bay Area, Silicon Valley sort of origin story for these companies. You know, you get a coffee chat on Friday, you quit your jobs over the weekend, and on Monday you're incorporated with a, with a new venture. So um, serendipity and taking advantage of the resources that are available to you, I think those are both two uh, huge takeaways from Erica's story. Um, let's move on now to Anna. So what got you uh, sort of into this AI world and, and sort of uh, biting the AI bug, as it were? Yeah, um, no, we, we, like, we all have a lot of funny stories to share. Um, so we started building Scalable's AI um, actually about two and a half years ago. So that's before the entire Gen AI tsunami, right? So it happened also serendipitously, right? So went to a, I, I went to a conference with my current co-founder. I kind of connect him to as a speaker to, for that conference, and he was giving a speech about you know how do you scale quickly scale tech. Um, team, right? He used to be CTO at Indiegogo, at Redbubble, used to run Yelp's mobile team. Um, so he had a lot of experience really scaling data-driven uh, personalization um, social marketplaces, right, in a way. And then he gave a speech, and after a speech, we have like 30 people lined up trying to ask us questions and then um, see if, if there's any way we can help their company. And then at that moment, we're like, there's such a big demand, maybe we should create something to really help these people at scale, right? Literally, the same night, we went on Squarespace, created a website, launched the next day, asking, hey, if any of you would be interested in an out-of-the-box personalization AI tool. And we had, we had about five people actually paid for a, um, I think we're charging like $50 at the, per month at the time. Five people paid for it on the spot. I'm like, okay, great, this is a good signal. We should, we should definitely test that out. So that's when we start building our first version of Scale Growth AI, which is providing this out of the box um, modular approach to quickly launch personalized uh, applications for your customers, for your networks, for your, you know, for, for, um, for marketplaces, right? <clears throat> so that was the original story of Scale Girls AI. And in a way, we were building something different from Gen AI. It's really about machine learning detecting pattern, be able to make the right recommendation at the right time for the right reason with the right context. Um, we, that, so that's our initial product. And then when Gen AI happened, and that just expanded our offerings, because what happened with Gen AI is AI is there to replicate human intelligence, right? So what we were building before, if you think of human intelligence, you can kind of break that down into two components. One is, hey, um, I'm thirsty, I want to drink water, I know how to get water, where to get water. And that's me making decision, realize that needs. And then once I have that needs, my, you know, my brain fires up neuron, tell my body to make certain actions to grab water and drink that, and that's execution, right? So what, a, what LEM and Gen AI enabled is be able to allow any um, you know, task to be able to complete end-to-end -end with AI. So what we did with you know, personalization AI, recommendation AI, that's the decision part. And then once we have that decision, we can actually leverage LLM model, Gen AI, to be able to complete that end-to-end -end execution. And that's where we hop on this Gen AI tsunami and be able to really expand our offerings and uh, really to be able to see how our customers are able to grow from there. 
Excellent. Thank you, Anna. And I think Anna's story uh, represents a sort of emblematic um, paradigm shift that a lot of people who are in the AI world for quite some time had to undergo, um, you know, say around two or three years ago, where you know we're all happy with our class, what we call our classical machine learning models, yeah. predict a number between zero and one, you know, do this, do that, and then suddenly we're confronted <coughs> with the realization that there's this whole new paradigm of not only prediction but of computing, as it were, yeah. and we have to figure out how to, you know, whether we want to graph that onto our existing efforts, how we want to do that, and ultimately figuring out how to do it in a measured way. Um, that preserves sort of the essence of the things we're trying to build, but leverages these expanded capabilities that these uh, newfound frontier developments yielded. Um, so to round us out, Marianne, uh, care to share your story about how the AI bug bit you? Definitely. So mine started even before Gen AI was very popular. So I was head of engineering at this e-commerce company, and we were matching women with different types of jewelry. So we had a very clear problem to solve is with you know thousands and thousands of matches of thousands of jewelry, how do you match that jewelry with the right person. So we started developing our own algorithms to try to match them. And really, that's how I started into this AI realm. So after I left this company, I joined MindBody. And in MindBody, because I was head of engineering NSF and the whole world was moving into AI, I helped spun the AI department at MindBody in San Francisco. After that, I kind of forgot about it a little bit. I started my own recruitment agency. But a few months into it, we grew so fast. And then I had a scaling problem. Now we had like thousands and thousands of potential talent and thousands of jobs. Well, how do you solve that problem? How do you connect the right person with the right talent? And really, if you think about it, it's no different than connecting the right women with the jewelry. It's no different than connecting any two different things together. So in order for us to do it more efficiently, I figured that we needed to use AI to do it. Then I started researching a lot of AI tools, and some of them did solve like certain problems, but there was no end-to-end -end solution that would make my life easier as a, as a recruiter. So then I decided to build my own solution with AI to, to solve that problem. So that's how I got into it. Is, I experienced the problem, I could not find a solution to it, and then I figured out how to build it. And when you think about it, it is intimidating because AI is such a big subject, but the thing to realize is that it hasn't been around that much that most people had to learn it in the last few months, especially Gen AI. So don't be intimidated to go and watch a video about it to try things maybe find a solu find a problem that you've been passionate about or that you've been experiencing and try to solve it with AI. Take courses, use no-code tools, and that's really your way into it. Once you get the foot in the door, then another thing you could do is start going to networking event, meet different startup founders, and then maybe propose to them to become an intern or that you can help them solve their problem without needing any compensation. And then after six months to a year of doing that, you'll have more knowledge than I guarantee you 99% of the population in AI because everybody is just starting new. And then you can get a full-time job with AI and you'll get a really good job at a fast-growing company. So that's like one way to get into it. Excellent, thank you, Marianne. And I think her, um, her story just reiterates, um, you know, the door is wide open in the AI world especially in the year 2024, and you will not see a single credible job posting that asks you for a decade or even half a decade or even three years of generative AI experience because that just doesn't exist. So if you have the grit, you have the um, capacity to learn, to pick things up, you know, the door is wide open for you in, in this uh, new era of AI. Um, so we're going to jump into a question specifically for Erica now. Um, so Erica is the founder of DAX AI. Um, and uh, DAX AI is solving for a need that many different uh, AI implementers have different takes on. It's this idea of using AI to perform search, information retrieval, knowledge discovery, and there are all of these different scientific and technical techniques that one could use to integrate AI into each of these workflows. But Eric, I'd like to hear from you as to sort of the special spin that DAX is taking on this sort of general market of 
AI-infused, AI-powered knowledge retrieval. Awesome, yeah. So um, if you think about the market of search, if you go onto Google and you search anything, it comes up with relevant articles, right? Um, but think if you could go onto Google and it not only answers your question, but it answers questions that are very, very specific to you personally, right? And that are accurate. There's no hallucinations happening and very specific to your company. Um, so that's exactly what we do. And my co-founder actually built Knowledge Graph at Google. So he was one of the lead engineers that actually b built that retrieval search engine. And then when he was at OpenAI, he worked as the lead developer on retrieval. And so he's really combining we're combining his two skills in both building a database from scratch and also extracting information from text documents, um, PDFs, all the different pieces of text that we use that are so rich in, docu in information, but just hasn't been able to be extracted and then put into a structured data system yet. But we're, we're now doing that. So we're able to extract information from textual documents, PDFs, and then now put it into a structured system. So you can just talk to your documents, just like you would um, talking to Google or you'd talk to OpenAI, only you're talking to your own information and you're getting accurate retrieval out of that. Um, so a, a couple common use cases, um, healthcare for example, doctors have a lot of research, right, on the different diseases that can happen. And there's also a lot of patient records and patient information, that's structured data. The unstructured data is gonna be in those documents. And so when we extract the information from those documents, plus you bring in the structured data, you can diagnose patient illnesses, the doctors can just write, type in the, the symptoms, and then it comes up with a diagnosis, similar patients that they saw, that they have um, cared for that had similar illnesses. It's very, very powerful. So we're talking to Kaiser about that one right now. Um, some others are, include legal, right? So there's a lot of legal documents, and in legal diligence, they um, need to extract information from all of those legal documents and the lawyers have to talk to the documents in plain English and just say, hey, do these um, documents contain anything that could trigger indemnification or significant liabilities? And it will not only answer the question, but we also are able to reference where that information came from. They can click on the reference, it takes them directly to the PDF. So there's a lot of different ways to increase AI accuracy, to reference it, save time with our client. It saves them 80% of the time on their legal diligence process. That allows them to have more customers, take more of the market share. It's very, very powerful. And also, like even if we just talk about, we're, we're at the USPTO, if we talk about patent review, for example, like pulling and extracting information out of patents and bringing up related patents in the knowledge graph is very, very powerful for being able to do um, like patent review, for example. So it has a lot of applications horizontally because everyone has massive amounts of documents, information that they need to pull data out of and put that into a more structured way so that it's, it's accurate retrieval. Awesome. Uh, and that was, that's one of the sort of prototypical use cases of AI generally and Gen AI specifically, uh, this idea of you know using documents as a knowledge corpus to be able to ask questions in sort of plain English. Now, I, sometimes I wish I could just ask my emails questions in plain English. It's um, it's quite a quite a knowledge and information deluge that we're all faced with in the 21st century, and AI can be a part of helping us navigate through that. Uh, the next question is going to be one specifically for Anna. Um, so Anna is the founder of uh, Scale Growth, which, um, Anna, one of the things I find striking about Scale Growth is this idea of you know, using low-code, no-code solutions to try to democratize the footprint of impact realizable with AI. Mm -hmm. So you know, a lot of um, AI has classically required these uh, sort of super scientists, super engineers, um, people who've written you know, code and these esoteric languages for years on end, and you know, with the with the advent of generative AI and some of these frontier technologies, the barriers to entry have definitely lowered. And I think efforts like Anna's are are key to 
helping us lower that barrier, barrier of entry. So Anna, could you share a bit about uh, how scale growth came into being in a way that sort of advances this um, vision of democratized AI? Yeah, um, it has always been our mission to give the power to the non-technical people to be able to quickly turn their you know, vision, dream into reality, right? And that including many of you here, especially government agency, there are so many brilliant ideas that you wanted to implement, but because of the lack of you know, resources, um, fundings that you can't, you don't, you don't have that resource to do everything, especially when you need to spend million dollars to just hire one or two data scientists, right? So, um, so what we have been doing, and maybe this is a good time just to give you one of how, how one of our customers, they, they are actually is a federal funded agency, right? They, they are, um, they call the um, New Growth Innovation Network. And their mission is to advance uh, inclusive economic development across the country. And their goal, like they have a mission to really engage as many as city from large to small. So they have a very dispersed geographic distribution of their members. And they wanted to contribute as much as they can, make that impact, and they can continue to get funded to run this program. Um, so that's their mission. But the challenge is they have a very small team. I think when, when, when they came to us, they have a three-person team. Right, and then they wanted to be able to create an online space where they can engage all of their members across the country to be able to learn, to share information, to host events, to really exchange the knowledge so people can all elevate together each other and be able to elevate the inclusive economic in their local system. Um, and and so, so be able to bring them together is first thing. And number two is, they need to have a way to be able to leverage data to show the impact, right? I think that's a really important point because a lot of us, you know, when we are not coming from technical background, we don't have the knowledge to how can we, first of all, collect data. Once you have that data, how can we organize data in a way that gave me the insight to, to help me understand how is my product service helping you know, mass amount of people. And then lastly, how can we present this data to the people who can help me to continue provide this service, to continue impact more and more people, right? So what Scale Girls was able to help them is number one, we we're able to quickly help them launch a portal for all of their members. So almost think of almost like your private LinkedIn, right? We literally launched a private LinkedIn for NGIN in the matter of three days. And they were able to invite all of their members to come together, have a space to have their own profile, to be able to have that conversation with each other, be able to find each other easily, share information, share resources, organize events. And because of this unique space, that's how NGIN is able to actually track all the activities, engagement, and, and understand how people are using it. And then on top of that, like I shared earlier, right? So we start by providing this hyper-personalized experience, just like what Marion said, the matching recommendation engine that's building into scale growth, right? So we are able to serve the right content for the right person at the right time with the right context. And one of the metrics that was super, super impressive by NGN is their email, so we have this personalized digest that's sent to each individual, and it's different for everyone, right? Because we understand who they are, what they are here for, and what they're looking for. So their email opening rate is 80%, and that's way above industry standard. I think the industry standard is about 10 to 20%, right? So because of this personalization, they are able to like really engage their member because the member are getting what they are looking for, right? And then recently, because we launched our AI agent, so NGI and their leadership team is able to use our AI analyst to create report and use that, you know, the report, what they will be able to ask smart questions to help them to show what are the impact um, NGI is able to bring 
the um, all the local cities on the on the on the um, on the level, right? So they are able to use that report to get four years fundings down the road. So that's that's how we are able to leverage AI and leverage this type of no code solution help someone who doesn't have the technical background be able to achieve this type of impact. Awesome, and I know that I do not read anywhere close to 80% of my email. So um, you know, to have a solution that can create engaging content, again, zero code, zero AI, uh, sort of special sauce that you need to know yourself that can get you those level of engagements is, is something I think is truly remarkable. Um, so last uh, question specifically directed to Marianne. Uh, Marianne's actually aware of two hats in the AI ecosystem. She's led uh, technical teams in the AI space, but also uh, more recently she's been a funder of AI pursuits by others in the capacity of um, uh, being a partner at a venture capital firm. So Marianne, um, speaking from a venture capital perspective, can you share with us uh, what you view to be some of the most promising areas of AI um, and relatedly sort of how you go about thinking and reasoning about the, uh, the ventures and the initiatives that are most likely to yield in sort of concrete impact that you're, you're willing and eager to fund? Definitely. So first off, I think AI is going to revolutionize almost every industry that we know of. It's going to make everything more productive. So it's going to remove the need for this like manual, manual labor or manual repetitive task. It's going to make every single person more productive. But there are a few industries that I'm really excited about. The first one is healthcare. I'm seeing a lot of companies now being funded that are using AI to solve real healthcare problems. For example, using AI to diagnose cancer early or Alzheimer or heart disease. I'm seeing a lot of research going into AI drug discovery. Um, and most importantly now, there's a huge, huge sector being born called, called longevity. How do you use AI to make people live longer? Um, so that's really something that's gonna have an impact on each one of us, which is very exciting. The second part is climate tech. So a lot of AI now is being used for more efficient farming, for even detecting like trash in ocean, or for helping with decarbonization. Um, that's the second th sector. And the third sector is really, you know, SaaS tools. So every company, they have to have accounting, they have to have engineering, they have to have marketing. Well, AI is helping in each one of these sectors. For example, so I'm an engineer, so I can speak on the engineering side. In the past, to build a product, to build the first version of your product, it used to take probably five to eight engineers, six months to build that product. But now with generative AI and their ability to produce code, we can use one engineer to build a product in six weeks. Well, what that does to the world is now suddenly every single person can become an entrepreneur and can build and ship a product. So that really democratized entrepreneurship. And specifically for women founders, given that, I don't know if you all know, but women founders receive less than 2% of all VC money. So 2%, right? So we don't have the capital, as much capital to grow these startups and hire all these people. But now with AI, they can suddenly only need one engineer six weeks to build a product. They can, they don't need as much marketing help or sales help. They can be more productive. So that's going to give the rise of, you know, a solo entrepreneur. Um, so as you can see, see AI and Gen AI is so broad that every single aspect of building a company, running a company, every industry will be disrupted as a result. So I'm really excited about the future. Um, in terms of investing, and I think that was one of your question, what do I look for when I invest in a company? Whether it's AI or not, it really doesn't matter to me. The number one thing that I look for is the team, right? Who are you as a founder? Do you have the grit to really go through what it takes? 
to build a company, it's hard building a company. It takes a lot of resiliency. For every 100 investor that you pitch, maybe you're gonna get 99 no's and one yes if you are lucky. Do you have the grit to go through the ups and down of being an entrepreneur? And the second of all, the thing that I look for is, what is your competitive advantage? What do you have that others don't have, right? Do you have maybe you know 15 years of experience in your specific domain that others don't have? Do you have specific patents that others don't have? Do you have a trademark? Do you have a distribution channel? Maybe if you have an audience that you can then sell to, that's a huge competitive advantage for you as a founder. So that's really what I'm looking for, especially at the earliest stage of a company. Excellent, and I think uh, Marianne shared with us yet another instance of this general theme of lowering barriers to entry, being able to go from you know, 10 person developer team for half a year to one engineer in six weeks. Um, frankly, I'm envious because I think even with AI, we're, you know, that's, that's a pretty lofty dream from the government perspective. <laughs> One engineer, six weeks, get to a minimum viable product. But you know, the fact that you know we're getting there in industry is um, is something that's just just quite indicative of you know just the value that some of these technologies can uh, bring deployed properly. Um, so I think uh, the next question I'm going to share, and I'm not sure how much time we'll we'll have. We'll maybe one or two more questions before. Uh, we have to give up the mic, but next question is actually directed at all of you. Um, responsible AI has recently been a big topic in the world at large and uh, in the U.S. government specifically. Uh, so uh, the U.S. government has uh, recently uh, made a big push and many concrete investments in ensuring that you know we not only have the world's sort of uh, fastest, most capable AIs, but that the AI that is developed um, both within this country and globally is uh, safe, secure, and, and trustworthy. So can you talk about how you've um, implemented or thought about uh, responsible AI practices and principles in all of the AI work that you're either uh, leading yourselves or that you're seeing your portfolio companies uh, try to tackle? Um, we can go any order, whoever uh, has, has the first thought that jumps to mind. I'm happy to go. Um, so a huge part of what we have to do is have a secure AI system, right? There's a lot of challenges with the government um, not wanting to send data to OpenAI, not wanting to send data to Google, and even if you use the enterprise solutions, the data is still going back to OpenAI and Google at the end of the day, right? And so they need a self-hosted system. A self-hosted system means that you're running your own model in your own environment. It can be in your own cloud solution like GovCloud, or if it's a, a financial company, it would be in their own cloud solution or on-prem, um, which means it's not even touching the cloud at all. So what we build is a self-hosted LLM, which means none of the data of the users or of the consumers goes back to OpenAI. That means they have the accuracy level we're targeting at 98% accuracy while also being secure at the same time. If, it, if the client requires it, we don't even see the data ourselves because our solution can self-build its own database. We don't need to see the data in that in that solution, which is very, very powerful in terms of allowing um, the user to have very, very proprietary data in the system. Awesome, thanks for sharing. And I, I know that a lot of these cloud providers have um, you know, offered these highly guardrailed environments and, and products to help uh, bridge the gap between you know, the wild west of the commercial cloud and some of what more regulated industries uh, need. Um, so, that's a very good insight. Um, any other thoughts from Anna or Marianne? Um, I really like this question. Thanks for asking, and I, I, I love Erica's answer. So I'm gonna, because we're a no-code platform, right? So I'm gonna answer this from a layman's term. Um, when you adopt or deploy AI for your organization, like my, our recommendation is think of it as you're adopting, you're hiring a new team member. How do you put ethical guardrail by building a team, right? You can think that that could be consist of, consist of setting your uh, organizational, um, you know, guidance, guidelines, rules to do certain things. On top of that, there's a training for your team. How do you train your team so they have the same value, they have the same 
um, ethical practice that they will be able to grow, learn from that, right? Same thing applies to AI. When you do adopt AI, you like whether it's on the LM level or the application level, think about what rules, got rules you can put around that and be able to implement that. And then at the same time, in also inject the ways that how can you continue train your AI to be able to adopt these rules, learn this tool, and be more refined, be more smart about doing things. So always think about this from these two aspects and then just treat them as your team member. And they are because they are repl replicating our uh, intelligence, right? So that's my take on it. Excellent, thank you, Anna. And uh, Marianne, any thoughts from you to round this topic out? Yeah, definitely. So I think ethical AI is all about kind of reducing the bias that we all have, whether unconscious or conscious, and not passing it through AI. So how AI works now is that it uses past data to generate new data. So that's where ethical AI comes in, is what is the data that you are passing into AI? For example, let me give you an example. Let's say healthcare data. You want to predict if a certain person will get a certain disease, for example, right? Well, if the data that you passed in is 90% the male population, right? And then you try to, ma to make it predict for a woman, for example, who has a different body type, then there's already bias that comes into it because it has been trained on... Uh, you know, data that is not women's health. Um, and that's something we see a lot in the medical field is that a lot of the data that is present, unfortunately, is not about women and women's health and how we, you know, how our body operates. Um, so one of the things that I'm seeing a lot and one of the things that I support is a lot of these AI going to study women's health. So a lot of the companies that I'm supporting they, all they are doing is passing just research that has been done on women and women's data to these AI systems so that it can predict with less bias what you know, certain diagnostic tools or drug discovery will do. So that's just one example of trying to reduce bias in the data that we're, we're providing so that the AI then can act accurately predict for every single one of us and our body type and who we are and our, our diversity, basically. Awesome, thanks, Marianne. Uh, I think you hit on, uh, there's this like very common adage in the AI world, um, actually in the machine learning world before AI became uh, sort of the, the, the norm, sort of garbage in, garbage out, and I think uh, you're evoking a very related concept, which is bias in, bias out. You start with biased data, um, your models aren't going to really uh, remove it on their own. So you have to think carefully about um, how you deal with uh, shifts in distribution of the data that might not comport with the users who are actually intending to um, benefit from your tool. Um, so I think we have just under five minutes left. Uh, so I'd like to uh, ask one closing question, again, directed to all three of you, um, that I hope will evoke some of the uh, themes that uh, you all touched upon earlier today in a sort of condensed way that can um, perhaps uh, inspire some ideas or some future directions for our audience. Can you just share, you know, what's the one nugget of advice you might have for individuals, entrepreneurs, organizations seeking to uh, start leveraging AI to solve real world problems? And again, any order. Yeah, so I can, I can start this time. Um, I would say, first of all, understand what AI can and cannot do, right? Um, so AI can generate new data, AI can do matching, but just really understand that every single problem that it solves is different and unique. Um, the other thing is, you know, go and take a course online about it. Now there's a lot of YouTube videos, there's a lot of training about Gen AI, uh, but let's say, you know, you have a problem about matching, then go and research, okay, well, how does it Gen AI help? with matching or let's say you want to generate new data well then understand how all this works so really education at the beginning to to help with it the second part of it is maybe hire kind of the right talent um, so there are a lot of AI experts out there that you can reach out to to kind of just get a consultation on what is and what is not possible. Um, and then when you start to kind of get that knowledge base within your company, then um, you're gonna be 
much better suited to to kind of you know implement AI within within your within your culture. Um, and I would say the third advice that I would give to you know entrepreneurs is that um, don't be afraid to try it out yourself. So like again, as I repeated, let's say you have a problem that you've always experienced, go and try to solve it. Don't be afraid to build like an AI system. So one of the things that you could do, for example, that is very simple, OpenAI has this custom GPT. And with custom GPT is a no code tool, you don't really need to understand code, but you can customize a version of chat GPT to solve your problem. You can feed in data, you can play around with the model to make it operate like for a use case that you know of. And if you take that training, maybe it's gonna take you one to two months to build that custom GPT, but that by itself will teach you a lot of the things that you need to learn to then you know, use AI in a more professional manner. Excellent. Uh, I think summing that all up, you know, just this idea of go do it, go make your idea happen. The barriers to entry are, are low enough that you can contemplate just, just jumping in and, and seeing how far you can take an idea. Um, we're running up against time, so I'll ask uh, both Erica and Anna to give sort of the 15 to 20 second version of your, your negative advice before you hand it over. Awesome. One more time, the neg negative advice is... Uh, the nugget of advice. Oh, nugget of advice. Like, Sorry, you can give negative ne advice negative too, advice. but uh, um. you know, whatever flavor of advice you want to give. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just want to kind of piggyback off what Marianne said in terms of like, you can even ask AI how to solve a problem and ha ask how AI can solve that problem for you, right? Now, I also want to support that you should get professionals to help you if you're implementing this in an enterprise solution. Very different from just using it for your own personal use case. And then you also have to understand what kind of data you're putting into OpenAI and that they will then have access to that data. You should never put personally identifiable information into uh, like the general OpenAI chat, right? So you need to think about those kind of things. Um, and I, I totally agree that it's really important to just go out and try it, just play around with it, just test it. Um, and then, as Marianne said, there's a lot of companies that can help you with uh, just like an AI consultation. You're also welcome to contact us. I'm, you can reach me at erica at dax.ai. We um, talk to a lot of businesses every day on how to integrate more accurate AI solutions into their systems. And um, again, there's a lot of ways you can just kind of start asking it questions for your own business of like, how do I solve this problem with an AI solution? And then get an expert to kind of help you finish the, the last mile execution. Awesome, thank you, Erica. And last we have Anna to round us out. Take it yes. away. Um, so yes, I think number one, to understand what problem you are trying to solve, right? Whether it's solving problem, improving your productivity or improving any KPI. So have that very clear um, goal for it. And then the second thing is when you think about AI, think of is all the AI, let it be model or tools there, they are very fast, they are all fast cars. They go very fast, they are very powerful. But what's really important is a car without a good driver, it's just a car, right? So think about like, I always use this in our internal team, this is our inside joke. If you put a average uh, stereotypical Asian driver behind a Ferrari versus a Formula One driver behind a Toyota, I can guarantee you every time the Formula One driver is going to win. So what we wanted to really pay attention now is how do you drive that fast car, right? Is it the team? How, how is your team? Like, are your team equipped with the knowledge to use AI? Plus, are you using the right, the right retrieval that to retrieve the right data for the right reason and be able to constantly dynamically change that retrieval and that's extremely important because that's what aligns with your KPI with your goal. So if you want to chat more about that, understanding any of the use cases, um, team me up on LinkedIn, uh, Anna Yuan, or just email me at Anna at scalegrowth.ai. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to the audience for your attention during this uh, remarkable panel.